This period extends from 1796 to 1822. At the latter date, the innovators had so far succeeded as to effect the first change in the constitutional law of the church by expunging the Alconsol renovation. Contemporary with that fatal change, or rather leading to it, and rendering the change necessary for consistence, was the growing practice of occasional hearing. Yet this change in principle and correspondent change in outward practice met with resistance for a time by a majority. But the majority gradually succumbed until it had passed to the side of the declining party. For years, the minority contended against the increasing flood of doctrinal and practical error. Among the ministers of the new hopeless min minority were Professor Macmillan, Grieve, Thomas Henderson, and Reed. History attests that whenever the backsliders had prevailed so far as to remove the first organic principle of the church, Mr. J. Reed alone had sufficient fortitude to act upon his convictions by formal separation in 1822. I know that good men, while agreeing in principle, vastly differ in their estimate of principle, and that their practice is determined by their estimate of the value of a principle. The protesters of 1650 in Scotland had admitted that among the resolutioners there were many, quote, good and godly ministers, unquote. But, oh, their convictions of the value of principle do not enable them to obtain the crown of martyrdom, nor even hinder them from afterwards entering into fellowship with perjured curates at the Revolution settlement. Had the minority separated, as Mr. Reed was enabled to do in 1822, when the majority were manifestly irreclaimable, the Church might never have seen or been misled by the new testimony and terms of communion. After having shown by an induction of particulars what was the condition of the Church in Scotland before the beginning of the present century, the reader will not be surprised that her daughter in America should develop equal or even more rapid progress in declension. It is natural that a daughter imitate her mother, but having less experience, she is liable to be more attracted by what is deemed liberal and fashionable. Accordingly, the young and inexperienced ministers who had the chief hand in, quote, exhibiting their principles to the world changed the whole testimony of the Scottish martyrs and their legitimate successors. In doing so, they far outran the most lax of the fathers in Scotland at that date, 1806. For although occasional hearing had begun to be practiced a little before, 1796, a violation of the Alconsol Covenant and Testimony, yet such offenders had been, quote, dealt with by the session, unquote and no party in that land had yet entertained the thought of excluding either history or argument from the testimony. When the remodeling of the testimony was for years in progress, even after Mr. Reed had left the Synod, that innovation was strenuously opposed by the residuar residuary minority. Between forty and fifty years ago, I read with interest, and I think with some profit, certain publications by authors who were not ministers, but evidently intelligent and more faithful than most of their guides. One of these, quote, printed at Edinburgh in 1823, unquote, purports to be an answer to a letter of Reverend Adam Brown of Crooked Home, unquote. The author of this answer signed himself as an old dissenter, but by comparing documents, I think his real name was John Doe. The motto prefixed to his pamphlet is the following, quote, Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Jeremiah 2, verse 36. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. Unquote. The reasoning of this intelligent Scotchman in 1823 appears to be conclusive, and it is as sound and seasonable in 1883 as when it was uttered. He says, quote, It appears too evident that Mr. Brown and the Senate have taken the pattern of the New Testimony from their friends in America, and new light seceders in this country. The Reverend Synod in America maintain that the historical part of their testimony is partly founded on human records and therefore not an article of faith, nor should it be incorporated with the confession of the church's faith. This quotation appears to be, excuse me, this quotation appears to me to condemn all the testimonies emitted by the parties professing to bear testimony to the Reformation. Both narrative and argument were incorporated with their testimonies. When our transatlantic synod made such a great change in their testimony, it was surely proper that they should have assigned some reasons for it. It matters very little to tell us that the narratives of men are fallible without proving that they have actually fallen and given a wrong statement of facts, 
and it will not be much better to inform us that the fallible narratives of men can never be a ground of faith, if this be meant of divine saving faith. But there is a human faith about human things, having such evidence as the nature of the case requires and admits, which, if we would deny, there could be no subsistence in human society. The concerns of all human things must, in many instances, depend upon the witness of men. How can a Christian obey the second commandment by confessing the sins of his fathers if human testimony be rejected? For on no other evidence can he confess them at all. Unquote. And our author might have shown that filial obedience enjoined in the fifth commandment is predicated on the sole credibility of human testimony. Quote, it must without doubt be as solemn a business to make confession of the sins of our fathers as to give an assent to the narrative of a testimony. Why then expunge the very strongest ground of withdrawing from corrupt churches? This Mr. Brown in his letter and the synod in the overture of a new testimony seem to do. If they act consistently on this plan, they will not need to publish any causes of fasting or confess any sins, but what they know are independent of human testimony." Unquote. It appears that in addition to isolated pamphlets, from one of which the extracts given above have been taken, a magazine issued quarterly from Edinburgh was commenced by some person or party in the year 1624. Whoever conducted this periodical wrote anonymously. He wielded, however, a caustic pen, and displayed a high degree of literary culture. Part of the title chosen for this quarterly will indicate the intelligent reader, the sarcastic complexion of the author's style. Quote, the elucidator of the spirit of the Third Reformation, unquote. It would seem that its criticism of public men and measures, and more especially its exposure of their private intrigues and character, proved too strong pabulum for the taste of a declining community. I give only a little sample of much that might be quoted. The editor says, quote, We lift our pen at the call of an imperative duty, which is both our warrant and apology for doing so. In our prospectus, issued a month ago, we have broadly avowed the motives which called us to the field and pointed out the objects to which our attention would be mainly directed. And now, in the discharge of that important duty, we desire to present ourselves to the notice of that portion of the discriminating public who feel they have an interest in these concerns which are more immediate to be brought under review, and who are sensible that whatever affects the profession and exercise of discipline in the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland ought to be viewed by them as a matter of no trivial importance. Quote, the testimony we have avouched, the principles we profess to maintain and contend for, profess too much intrinsic value in themselves, and which have descended to us, consecrated with too much precious blood, to be bartered away at the shrine of apostasy and corruption, or sapped by judicial intrigue. The Reformed Presbyterian Synod of Scotland profess to be endeavoring to maintain and diffuse the principles of the Reformation. Little can we promise our readers but a display of the most obvious manifestation of a decay of principle and dereliction of duty, coupled with as many shuffling sophistries, maneuvers, and intrigues as ever disgraced the name of the Reformed cause, or stained the annals of a tribunal of ecclesiastical judicature. Any who opposed their downward course were treated with contempt, their petitions and complaints thrown over the bar with disdain, and themselves stigmatized in the very minutes of synod as blasphemers, perverters of scripture, enemies of the church's peace, fomenters of divisions, and actuated by the spirit of the devil." Unquote. 